Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar hosted by the NIH funded uh, MD2K Center based at the University of Memphis. Uh, my name is Vivek Shetty and I'm the MD2K's training core director. Today's uh, webinar on implementation science is led by Laura Damschroeder. Uh, she's an implementation researcher with the uh, VA uh, Ann Arbor Center for Clinical Management Research. Uh, Laura is uh, acknowledged to be a thought leader in implementation science and uh, was the lead developer of the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research, also uh, known as CFIR, uh, one of the most uh, widely cited frameworks in implementation science. Uh, uh, we are, she's also a graduate of the ML Training Institute and has a good sense of the intersection of mobile health and the challenges it poses as a platform for implementation science. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on the MD2K's M Health Hub. Uh, those of you signing on, please make sure you are on mute. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type them into the question box in the Blue Jeans control panel. Uh, we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, with that, I turn it over to Laura. Laura, it's over to you. Good morning to the West Coasters and good afternoon to everyone else, in, at least in the U.S. Um, Thank you so much for signing in today. Um, I really appreciate having the opportunity to um, speak today about implementation science um, within the context of mobile health. Um, this presentation has been really interesting for me to prepare because um, it is a topic that I have been wanting to kind of formalize better in my own mind in terms of the interface and, and exactly how the science of implementation can be and should be applied within the mobile health um, sphere. And uh, which brings to the table um, challenges that are very different from, for example, the, the kind of person, human delivered behavior change um, interventions that I typically work with within a clinical setting. Um, so bringing in um, mobile health um, devices, connectivity, mobile health-based interventions just really makes the whole um, wickedly complex problem of implementation um, all the more spicy and interesting. Um, so first of all, a couple of definitions. I just want to make clear, what is implementation? Where uh, Those are efforts designed to get innovations. Innovations mean anything new. Um, whether it's a, an incremental um, change for an organization or kind of a social system or a collective of uh, human beings that are working together toward a common mission, um, or it's, it, it may be an evidence-based, um, you know, highly complex multi-component um, program. Um, but the key is that deliberately initiated activities are used to get that innovation into routine use within a system. The science of implementation, our goal is to promote systematic uptake of um, specifically clinical research findings and other evidence-based practices into routine practice. We really want to accelerate the commonly cited, you know, 14 or more years to get just a tiny um, proportion of evidence-based practices and improvements into the hands of patients who um, would benefit from that. Um, implementation is hugely challenging. Um, it is a complex process within and of itself, and it's being done within um, complex contexts. And rather than kind of uh, controlling features of context out or ignoring, them as in a typical randomized controlled trial, we're rather embracing these features of context and really seeking to understand how they interact and how they shape 
the process of implementation and ultimately, like I said earlier, the use of these innovations, evidence-based innovations. Our kind of core or holy grail question within the scientific field is to understand what strategies work in which context to reliably implement evidence-based innovations. Um, and, and, or another way to put it is what works where and why. We want to be able to um, understand what processes and paths lead to success. Um, so by way of background, um, up to this till recent years, we really have acted as if there's like one ring that rules them all or one path that kind of rules them all, as if one size fits all, as if one you know, strategy, one way to implement um, will work everywhere, or that an intervention in, or innovation will work the same in every context. And I think we as individual professionals know that that is not the case. We certainly know it intuitively and experientially, but as a kind of collective, you know, the research paradigm has kind of assumed um, a simple uptake and linear uptake. The fact is that we need adaptations. And there's also this concept of equifinality, meaning that there is more than one path to success, more than one path to failure. Um, and adaptations are required because innovations are going into the same you know, innovation coming out of a clinical trial or out of a research knowledge base are being implemented in very different contexts from communities to rural clinics to large urban medical centers. Um, and now with the introduction of mobile health um, technologies, um, highly decentralized, um, maybe there's a hub, maybe there isn't a hub, maybe they're connected with a clinic or a health system, maybe they're not. Um, we are in the midst, I'm actually leading a randomized control trial of a mobile health intervention that really is, I think for a lot of the audience here, maybe a fairly simplistic um, intervention, but it's um, kind of new news to actually do this within um, the VA environment because of all the security and um, IT kind of barriers that we have within our health system, which that is a very real um, contextual challenge that uh, many of us, many health systems face um, in implementing and integrating mobile health interventions. So in the case of our trial, we have a Fitbit device, the Fitbit Charge 2, which is kind of at the center of an intervention, um, also a Bluetooth scale and a, smart, and a smartphone with a dashboard um, so that users get real-time um, feedback. But what if we, you know, these this, these devices are pretty ubiquitous in the, you know, in retail and in, you know, kind of the consumer um, sphere. We, anybody can go to Target and buy one of these and use it and maybe improve their um, lifestyle or increase their physical activity for some period of time. I think the evidence shows that use of these devices alone wears off over time, that the effects um, are, are pretty short-lived. Um, what if we wanted to connect these interventions in with the clinician so that the clinician had access to um, uh, levels of activity of their, of their patients so that they could take that into account as they do shared decision making about various treatment options? What if that physician is interacting with a patient within the healthcare system and, and wants to refer patients to this um, uh, intervention that maybe with the device in the smartphone alone, or what if we add a coach who's in the community, or what if the coach is part of the healthcare system, or what if the coach and the patient are both in the community? How do we connect them together? What are the contextual factors? Well, how does that change in rural versus urban areas? What if the coach and the patient are in completely different locations or different cities? So clearly, all one size does not fit all. Um, and, and one quote that you know, jumped out at me in this particular paper by Abbott et al. So one size fits all in health IT implementation is a fallacy. And I think there's you know, um, increasing recognition of that. Um, but several frameworks do show promise for use as a scaffolding to begin to assess best practices, their distinct dimensions, and their applicability for use within the mobile health sphere. 
Um, our kind of guiding um, pathway or meta hypothesis, I guess, within implementation science is ultimately that we really do need to tailor strategies. And, and it's not just a strategy, but a suite of strategies to context. And in order to do that, we need to first assess context. And there is a little bit of a black box here in, OK, now that I know and understand about my context, how do I choose strategies that will move implementation forward? But let's just say for now that there's this kind of magical process where we choose the right strategies. I'll break open this box a, li a little bit later. Um, but then we execute those strategies, hopefully for successful implementation. So I'm going to talk first about assessing context and use as an illustrative case one of our published studies um, about the implementation experience of a telephone lifestyle coaching program within the Veterans Healthcare Administration. This is not exactly a mobile health application, obviously, but it is a non-traditional um, uh, interface with patients outside of our healthcare system. So this intervention, this coaching, was delivered by a separate entity. And what we were looking for from the medical centers within the healthcare system were referrals of appropriate patients for TLC or for telephone lifestyle coaching. You could substitute TLC with a mobile health uh, intervention with or without coaching, like I um, showed earlier. Um, and then I'm also going to kind of do a lighter touch on another case. It's, it's based on a published study by Varsi and colleagues of an internet-based patient provider communications portal um, that was being implemented in five hospitals uh, units within Norway, in Norway. Um, so with the TLC implementation, from the beginning, uh, this is a graph that shows time from the left to the right. And you can see the, the ramp up of what it took to, or the pace of referrals or the rates of referrals of patients to the TLC intervention. And you can see that by the end of the intervention, by the end of the pilot, there was wide diversity. Um, seven times the, the highest, the site with the highest referral rate had seven times the number of referrals as the sites with the lowest number of referrals. And our essential question really is, why was this? And we um, followed this trajectory kind of real time as we, as the implementation unfolded and then did ref um, retrospective reflection on that process. We, of course, used, as Vivek um, introduced in the beginning, um, I am the lead developer of the Consolidated Framework for Implementation Research. We call it the CIFR. Um, this is a framework that provides a, a taxonomy or a listing of theoretical constructs that are believed to influence implementation. So you could view these constructs as mediators or moderators of implementation, or kind of a more broad term that is increasingly being used as determinants of um, successful, uh, or determinants of implementation outcome and outcomes. And I will step through this framework, but what this, this and other frameworks like this, when I talk about the CIFR, the same principles apply regardless of the framework that you're using. And what this framework provides, or what any uh, framework like this provides, is a language and a way of articulating um, complex uh, uh, factors within um, context. So our research question with the TLC evaluation um, implementation essentially were to understand what were, what were or are the barriers and facilitators to implementing. Um, and we use the CIFR to guide semi-structured interviews um, and other qualitative data. And we use that to code and to kind of pull out these different types of determinants that were acting for or against implementation efforts from context. The first domain of the CIFR um, recognizes the importance of intervention characteristics. 
So interventions, you know, within the um, kind of broader health IT world, you know, maybe connected systems, maybe smartphone apps, maybe decision support systems within the clinic, outside the clinic, may vary in um, size and in complexity and in uh, interface and, and who, you know, whether it's patient facing or clinician facing. Within the CIFR, there are eight constructs that are defined, and many of these particular constructs um, are developed um, out of Everett Rogers' classic um, diffusion of innovations theory. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few examples as I step through each of these domains. In the case of intervention characteristics, um, one factor that may influence uptake or success of implementation are key stakeholders' perception of the evidence strength and quality. Now, it's not just research evidence, but it's also their own clinical experience with similar programs or uh, their patients' um, experience with similar programs. Um, so this is a quote one person said, I was impressed with the evidence, and I know from our own patients um, who have been successful with a similar program. Um, so these are kind of two sources of evidence that this person was drawing upon and had a positive perspective. Um, which is helpful for engaging people in um, successful implementation. Even though we had the same materials, the same communication, the same evidence base, not everyone felt this way. Um, in the Varsi study, uh, a construct that came out in their work was the uh, construct related to relative advantage. So it's stakeholders' perception of the relative advantage of the new way of messaging through a website with their patients um, compared to phone and face-to-face -face, um, interactions. And uh, people felt that this was time-saving, um, and so they saw a relative advantage. But again, that was not the case in all of the five units where they were implementing this. And then just kind of a broader example from mHealth, uh, mobile health sphere in general, is that the construct of design quality and packaging, which is defined within the CIFR, but it, it's not defined specifically for IT. And I think that there are a lot of sub-themes and sub-constructs related to design quality and packaging that are particularly important for IT um, and mobile health type interventions. Um, certainly, COTS et al. Um, recognize that ease of use and aesthetic qualities are key to uptake of mobile health interventions. The th um, second dimension are the characteristics of the individuals who will ultimately use the intervention routinely, and also the individuals who are involved with getting it implemented. Um, and we, within implementation science, we tend to focus a lot on the clinician um, or, you know, people working within a medical system, medical clinic, um, we're very focused on um, delivery of care because we're um, focused on interventions that already have an evidence base. They've already been shown to be effective in randomized controlled trials. Randomized controlled trials, almost by definition, just because of their focus within healthcare, um, has as a unit of analysis the patient. And so there's already an evidence base that's showing um, improvements key, you know, on, in key measures, key outcomes among patients. Within implementation, we tend to focus on the clinicians who are to deliver that intervention to their patients in some way. Um, and so the, their, their characteristics are important in terms of their perceptions, their knowledge and attitudes toward the intervention. Um, within the CIFR, um, the individual characteristics, uh, the second domain, there are five different constructs. Um, I, I have a note down at the bottom of this slide that is that refers you to a paper by Kane et al. And I have a series of citations at the end of this slide set that I will make available. Um, but, but there are others who have done a lot of work in individual behavior change and individual um, change constructs. And the CIFR touches on individual characteristics very lightly and very broadly. But one of the constructs is in knowledge and beliefs. And for TLC, 
um, someone said, you know, I heard one physician say, oh, it doesn't work, they regain the weight anyway. These physicians are clearly not going to be uh, very high sources of referrals of patients to the program. In the VARSI um, study, they also, they noted that um, staff or key, key clinicians felt that the new portal, the new messaging portal, IPPC, that it was modern and future oriented and, and they thought that it should be a permanent service. It was almost like, you know, the, the cool factor and it would help brand them as being um, uh, forward thinking and technologically, um, you know, up to date. The uh, third domain within the CFER is the inner setting. And this is the domain that is the most explicated and probably the most um, complex um, and with 14 constructs and subconstructs. And just a few very you know, simple examples, just lightly touching on this. Within uh, the TLC implementation, there's a construct within the inner setting called compatibility. And clearly, within the IT world, I think you talk about um, a fit of IT kind of function with task um, and, and with user, you know, in terms of usability and fit in with um, clinical process or user process. And this certainly is a key construct um, for IT uh, as well as non-IT interventions. In uh, our example with the TLC implementation, there's one person who said health coaching, the TLC program, just fits right in with our disease prevention and health promotion programs, and it's such a compliment. And again, this attitude was not at all conveyed in every one of the 11 pilot sites. In the Varsi study, they really struggled with relative priority, um, that there were sites that really um, uh, here's one person who said, you know, suddenly the patient is gone. This is after a patient encounter with a clinician where the clinician was expected to let the patient know about this new way of interacting, that they had an option to do this messaging through the website rather than doing a phone call or having to come in for another uh, appointment. But, you know, then you've forgotten about it because there were so many other things and then demands from all sides. So relative priority is a construct that comes up a lot in our work as being um, a key issue. Um, and then structure, just kind of how is the organization structure and what infrastructure, kind of more broadly within mobile health, is there infrastructure to, for example, accommodate wearable device data? It's one thing to you know, link um, individual patient Fitbit data, for example, with a health system, you know, IT system or the electronic health record, um, just slurping that data in, but it's another challenge um, completely to have infrastructure and uh, processing capability of turning all of that data into meaningful information that is served up to clinicians in the right way at the right time um, so that they can make um, great treatment decisions based on that data. Um, and we have a lot of work to do in that sphere in terms of um, defining, you know, just what that looks like and how to integrate that into the clinical process. The fourth setting within the uh, domain within the CFER is the outer setting. And these are constructs that, um, that work from kind of the community or the regulatory um, ecological um, domain and, and put pressure in different ways within the inner setting and the ability to implement. This is a domain that is not terribly well explicated within the CFER. Um, there are four constructs, and I'll go through a few examples. With the TLC implementation, there's a, one of the constructs is called external policies and incentives. And this is kind of a catch-all construct to include payment um, uh, uh, rules, um, quality collaboratives or partic participation in quality collaboratives. Within the VA, there's a lot of pressure to meet quality metrics or performance measures. Measures And here's a quote where someone said, it helps to meet performance measures that nationally we need to meet. So use of the TLC or referring patients to TLC help them 
um, toward their performance measure, their performance goals. Um, patient needs and resources. It's very important that to understand, you know, in the case of the Varsi um, project, uh, they said, you know, here's a quote, I'm a little disappointed that the patients didn't use this messaging. I think it's sad that patients didn't appreciate the project more. Well, why is that? Is it because of access? Is it because of kind of lack of, um, you know, the perception by patients that they wouldn't have that personal um, touch? You know, we need to understand that. Within the M Health sphere in general, um, based on a study by Jay Ford and colleagues, um, the lack of financial reimbursement for um, kind of processing and interacting with um, mobile health data and interventions um, can be a challenge. The fifth domain within the CFER is the um, one related to process. So clearly if you have a high quality, a highly well executed implementation process, that will be facilitating toward achieving the implementation outcomes that are hoped for. Um, there are four broad constructs within the CFER, planning and engaging key people and executing and reflecting and evaluating. And the CFER is not prescriptive, like, oh, this is step one, step two, step three, step four, but rather to say that of all the there are other frameworks that are prescriptive about how to do implementation. And when you, we distilled those um, prescriptive frameworks, um, it really kind of settled into these four overarching constructs. And uh, then we also parsed out sub-constructs for a total of eight constructs and sub-constructs within the process domain. And what we're looking for here is kind of the quality and comprehensiveness um, the degree to which each of these four things um, are being done through the course of implementation. For example, in our TLC implementation pilot with 11 medical centers, um, engaging stakeholders was a real issue. In some sites, someone said, I didn't even know, this is a physician saying, I didn't even know that that was available for my patient. So clearly he's not going to be referring his patients because he didn't even know that TLC was available. Um, it's also really important to identify champions or um, implementation leaders who will really kind of take the baton and carry it forward. And in the case of the Varsi project, this was an issue in some of their units. Um, here's a quote that said, it was up to the individual nurse to take responsibility for and ask the patient about using the IPPC. And for us, that's the way it is with everything. And then I don't have the capacity to go and ask, have you asked? I mean, I can't follow up with everyone. Um, and so there was resistant for pe resistance um, for people in some of the units to take on the challenge of implementation. And then with engaging patients more broadly, um, you saw in the Varsi study how they kind of, you know, were puzzled about why more patients didn't use that messaging capability. And I think that that is a ubiquitous issue with um, many of these interventions, is how do we connect and engage, and not only just getting them connected um, in the first place, like getting them enrolled, getting them to touch the intervention, but then sustaining that engagement over time is an even larger challenge. So um, these are just my reflection. These are not meant to be comprehensive, but the CIFR is, um, you know, kind of uh, generic and abstract. It's meant to be able to be applied in a lot of different contexts, but it will, it does require operationalization um, to particular projects or across um, diverse kind of topics and contexts. And for mobile health, um, just a few, these are either, you know, need to be, should be considered at, um, for new constructs to, uh, that, that are not currently included in the CFER, or they may be subconstructs or particular operational, operationalizations of existing constructs within the framework. But things like, you know, what is the degree or the, the fit of user-centered design or use of user-centered design principles um, with clinicians, with patients, whether it's a clinician-facing system, a patient-facing um, intervention, um, the IT specifically, really, the IT infrastructure, both internal and external. So the, the electronic health record is 
kind of a big elephant within you know any healthcare organization. Um, and just as an example for external, you know, benchmarking data, data warehousing, um, communication with external servers like Fitbit, um, for example, to get physical activity data. Um, device availability and costs. Um, big questions around privacy. Um, some, you know, users express concerns about being tracked as they're using an intervention. Um, dealing with firewalls and security and HIPAA regulations, with all of which we encounter in our um, RCT of that earlier Fitbit intervention that I told you about um, earlier on. And then we need to compute, um, consider computer or device literacy and skills of, of the users. What's the trustworthiness or the quality of the data itself or the perception of the um, quality of data? And then the overall quality of um, the system, and turn, and, and including you know response times, number of clicks, navigation, are all really important um, considerations, which are nothing new to you, but um, within the sphere of implementation, they all interact with our ability to um, have sustained use of these interventions. We have a website, it's a, a technical assistance website called seferguide.org and it is freely available to everyone that kind of walks through this um, framework and um, provides a lot of detail with every one of the constructs and how to use them under various types of evaluations and implementations. One of the tools that we have on this website is what we call an interview guide maker tool. So a lot of our work has been based on qualitative data. Um, there are some quantitative measures that are available, but not many and hardly any of them are psycho psychometrically validated. Um, and so it really is kind of the um, nascency, I guess, of the science that we really don't have good measures for these constructs, quantitative measures for these constructs. So I invite you to jump in on that. Um, but until then, um, we uh, collect data through interviews, through site observations, um, through project meetings, and there is an interview guide maker tool that if you prioritize the constructs that you think would be most important for your project, um, you can go through this tool and basically check off boxes of questions that you think would be most applicable for your particular uh, project, and then you will get a formatted interview guide that you then can edit to um, tailor it for your specific project. And this is a great tool to use for like a master interview guide um, and to include in an appendix in um, a proposal. I think a lot of times reviewers want to see um, a, uh, you know, kind of a high level master interview guide if you're doing qualitative data collection. Um, then what we do with this qualitative data is that we then quantify it. Because what we want to do is, is um, do a little bit more, you know, uh, uh, in the early days we did, did kind of subjective assessments or, or looking for qualitative patterns to try to discern which of these constructs within this particular, you know, setting, scenario, um, seem to drive to success or failure. Um, so you may have a barrier, but it may not affect your implementation outcomes because there are ways of working around that or you can de-emphasize it in some way. Um, what we do with our qualitative data is that we rate it for whether it's a barrier or facilitator, so it's a negative number if it's a barrier and it's a positive number if it's a facilitator. <clears throat> and then we rate the qualitative data for strength of manifestation of each of the um, constructs within the clinical setting. So I'm just going to show you just very simple example. And we go, we have um, guidance for how to do this on that seferguide.org website. So an example with the concept of compatibility. The idea is that the more compatible an intervention is with an existing clinical workflow, um, the easier it's going to be to implement. Um, 
So an example of a negative rating, meaning that it was a strong barrier in this particular site, an example quote was, our nurses are specifically forbidden to write orders for referring patients to TLC. Um, everything that gets written has to be written by a physician, and this has formed a really labor-intensive situation for practitioners. So you can see the issue um, with attempting to implement a new program in this circumstance. Contrast that with another site where they had a, very, a strongly positive facilitating um, facilitator with respect to compatibility um, because the perspective was that this really helps the patient to have ownership for their process, for their living, and it blends very nicely with health coaching that they already had in place. They didn't see it as a competitor, but they saw it more as being aligned and as leveraging what they already had. Um, so now I've talked about assessing context, and in going through this process, what we want is to identify these determinants that are driving implementation out. So there are a few more steps that we have to do. And uh, first of all, I just want to kind of lay out a, kind of a, a heuristic model for um, the role of implementation to ultimately achieve the patient outcomes that we're looking for. So typically, you know, we want to implement an evidence-based clinical innovation, but we need to implement that innovation. If it's not being used, then clearly we're not going to get the outcomes or the benefit from that innovation. We need to define implementation outcomes, which are much more proximal to the implementation process. And these are things like acceptability, adoption, appropriateness, um, of, the, of the intervention, feasibility, fe, uh, fidelity. In our study, we um, had as an outcome a measure of penetration, and we operationalized penetration, um, which indicates the degree of usage of that intervention by looking at referral rates for each of the 11 pilot sites. Then we, then we hypothesized that if we've got good, robust implementation outcomes, those will lead to clinical service outcomes and, in the end, um, improve patient health and well-being. So like I said, in our TLC implementation evaluation, we had uh, penetration as our outcome. And then what we did was um, associate or look at the relationship or the association between those positive and negative uh, quantitative ratings with each of the CIFR constructs with the outcome. So what this red line shows on the top going from left to right are the facilities on the left with the lowest referral rates and the facility on the right with the highest referral rate. And we had a correlation of 0.55, and because our sample size was so small, our p-value was 0.08, we did have um, some associations that were stronger than this. Um, but then we can do this um, and, and compute these associations um, independently, for each factor independently, um, in a matrix, um, and then pull it all together. And with our TLC implementation, we found that there were seven CIFR constructs that were significantly associated with um, implementation outcomes, in other words, the rate of referrals. So each of these constructs seem to independently um, be associated with um, higher referral rates or high versus low. And so this kind of helps to explain why the wide diversity in referral rates between the 11 sites. When we compare the constructs that we found to be distinguishing between high and low you know, implementation versus the Varsi and colleagues study, you can see all of the brown squares are the ones that we identified in our respective projects as being uh, important constructs. In other words, they're constructs that we would hypothesize would lead to um, uh, this is a hypothesis-generating study, not proof, but that these may be the high-priority constructs to pay attention to for implementing the respective interventions. And you can see where we have some agreement across the two studies, but then we also have a lot of um, differences across the studies. 
And I think that this can be attributed to a combination of the intervention itself, the nature, the quality, the attributes, and the context within which they're being implemented. In the case of the VARSI study, it was within hospitals with complex patients. For TLC, it was within primary care clinics um, to, and, and for lifestyle change. Um, so now we've talked about identifying determinants and associating those with outcomes. And we've narrowed down to perhaps a smaller set of high priority contact, constructs. Now we need to choose strategies. And how do we go about doing that? And the science here has yet, there's much development to be done. And this is, um, you know, I invite uh, any of you to, you know, further help explicate kind of this black box here. But I'm going to talk about one study that we did to try to address this question. Um, there is a, um, a series of papers um, written by Byron Powell, Tom Waltz, and colleagues, I'm a part of this group as well, called the ERIC List of Implementation Strategies. And ERIC stands for Expert Recommendations for Implementing Change. And these articles that I have here on the screen um, list 73 implementation strategies that are grouped into nine clusters that were determined by concept mapping. Um, and these are the, this is the kind of the concept map result. Um, these are the nine clusters of strategies um, that were developed. And I'm not going to go into the details of exactly how the concept mapping was done, but it was um, uh, 70 some uh, implementation, quote unquote, implementation experts and implementers did participate um, in this uh, project or um, gave input um, to this project. And just as an example, breaking out one of these clusters, um, there are four strategies that are very broadly defined, like facilitation is a very broad, I call that a meta strategy, versus other clusters that have more discrete and detailed um, strategies like um, create new clinical teams or remind clinicians um, through possibly clinical uh, computer reminders, although those are overused in a lot of contexts. Um, what we wanted to do was to ask people, what strategies would you recommend, or do you think would best address each of the C for barriers um, or constructs as a barrier? So we sent invitations to 435 implementation um, researchers, and we 169 participated. The task was not easy. We asked people to identify up to seven strategies that would address a CIFR barrier. And so in this case, there's a CIFR construct called reflecting and evaluating, and that's, that construct is looking at the extent to which teams actually take time out to reflect their progress and make adjustments to the implementation process. So here, um, uh, users can select from the long list of 73 strategies and drag and drop it into a box, up to seven of those. So based on this input from our participants, um, uh, we, we actually randomly assigned a barrier to each participant. And, and again, like I said, select up to seven um, strategies to address them. Then we asked if they'd be willing to do another one. And if they said yes, then we would randomly assign them another barrier. Um, our participants addressed an average of six barriers, which is pretty good. We were targeting for about um, seven, I think. Um, and then we asked closing questions, like why did you choose the strategies that you did? And I'll go through that in a minute. What we found with this project is that there is a lack of agreement on which strategies to address which barriers. And you can see the long list of strategies that are listed on the left side here. Um, and there were, I think, an average of 30-something strategies that at least one person recommended. And there were not very many strategy barrier combinations that had more than half of the participants choosing that strategy. Um, so in the case of this one construct called reflecting and evaluating, um, there were two strategies where there 
was a majority of the respondents who agreed that these two strategies, um, develop and implement tools for quality monitoring and doing audit and providing feedback would help to um, resolve lack of reflecting and evaluating by teams. And then there were an additional set of strategies that we called level two recommendations. This is um, where at least 25% of participants agreed that these would be among the seven best approaches. Um, so when we look at the construct of compatibility, which I was talking about earlier, um, we did not, our, our participants did not um, develop any level one recommendations um, because there was um, kind of more diversity in recommendations. Um, but there, is, there were a series of um, level two recommendations, meaning not quite the majority um, of, of uh, participants, but um, fairly strong adore, endorsement relative to other recommendations. So in the case of um, a barrier around compatibility, so this is the quote that I had earlier about nurses being forbidden to write the orders and that really causing a kind of a, a, a clog in the process. So we recognize that as a barrier. Now, how do we choose an ERIC strategy? When we look at the level two recommendations, um, I've got 10 strategies that I might choose between. So then, um, you know, if I know, you know, kind of the, the context, the feasibility of actually enacting any of these strategies, let's just say that I choose um, promote adaptability um, among the um, stakeholders and to identify and prepare champions. And so when I look at this, um, identifying and preparing champions, I can, if I, if I um, successfully um, identify a champion or get a volunteer, someone who really believes in this TLC implementation, um, he or she may be able to influence their coworkers to, um, first of all, adapt the process in a way that works within their clinic without increasing workload. Um, and then it also serves to kind of reinforce this idea of promoting adaptability. So the champions, you know, these two strategies together um, happen to be mutually reinforcing because our um, implementation or implementers and implementation experts um, recommended these strategies for both of these CIFR barriers. Um, we are in the process of creating a tool for selecting, easily selecting these strategies based on the CIFR barriers, and we plan to post this on the CIFR guide um, website within the next few months. Um, so now, when going back to kind of this heuristic causal model, um, high-level causal model, um, there's a little bit more work to be done because there's a lot that happens between implementation on the left side and then the implementation outcome. Um, we really need to be um, detailed about um, specifying. It's not enough to specify an implementation strategy. It has to be further um, described in terms of who are the agents, who's delivering it, who are the targets, um, what is the specific mechanism of change? Um, what are even more kind of micro and closer outcomes that indicate that that mechanism of change is in fact um, a mechanism of change and that the um, strategies are, are actually changing it in the direction that we expect? Um, so people have, so there's actually a paper that was written by Lewis et al. Um, recently and then Birkin touches on it um, that talks about using uh, um, adaptive designs and, um, and I would say, you know, QI techniques also are, they don't use this language, but definitely having your theory of change is, is very important. Um, so in conclusion, I have a, a quote from um, Jones et al. that the most important improvement that can be made in health IT evaluations is increased measurement, analysis, and reporting of the effects of contextual and implementation factors. Not an easy thing to do, but a really important um, area for us to continue to advance our understanding in the science.
Thank you.